Okay, we're ready to get started. And so welcome everyone to today's discussion, the missing pieces in the customer health puzzle. Has anyone ever had a random churn notice from a customer that you thought was happy? Ever had that awful or uncomfortable experience trying to explain that to your executive team? We hear it all the time. Instinct will only take you so far, and customer success teams are struggling with their health scores, even with modern day CS technology stacks. So what do you do? We're gonna dive into this today. We're speaking with three CS leaders from top technology companies, and we'll be discussing how they hone their health scores to improve how they serve their customers. Lots to talk about, and we're gonna get into it in just a minute. First, really excited by the people that we have joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking to Jess Machino, VP of Account Management at Workable, Michael Taylor, SVP of Global Customer Operations at Click Dimensions, and Chad Hornfelt, Director of Customer Success at Customer. <clears throat> it's going to be a great discussion. We're going to learn quite a bit about <clears throat> the health signals that you should be collecting, how should CS teams balance subjective and objective health metrics, what to do when you're receiving two disparate signals. And throughout the discussion, we'll talk about plenty of mistakes that have been made and how to best plan for success. <clears throat> now, before we jump in, I wanna talk about just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. The webinar is gonna be recorded and the slides will be shared after the webinar is over. You'll also be able to find the recording on our YouTube channel and on our website. If you have, uh, we're gonna be doing a few polls during the discussion as well. We encourage everyone to participate because it's gonna, it's gonna drive some of the conversations that we have. And lastly, if you have any questions for the panelists, please type them into the question box. I'll be monitoring those along the way and we'll be including them in the conversation. <clears throat> so the first thing we wanna do is kick off with a quick poll to understand where everybody's coming from in the audience. What we'd like to know is a little bit about the state of maturity of your CS program. So three buckets, and of course, there's no wrong answer here. It's just, this is the, the state of your world. Um, a low maturity state and just starting out. Medium maturity, I got a small team, somewhat leveraging data, or we're in a high maturity, very advanced, large team, highly data-driven situation. We'll keep it open for about 30, 45 seconds to let everybody have a chance to reply, and then we'll talk about the results and continue. Our first lie detector question. <laughs> right. Okay, so it looks like about 95% of the audience is in low to medium maturity with only one or two respondents being in a high maturity state. So thank you for participating in that. As we talk about the things that we have to talk about today, we'll make sure and we um, will address uh, our answers towards um, all of those three different uh, buckets of maturity. So thanks, thanks for everybody for participating in that. And now we'll take a few minutes just to introduce the panelists and then we'll jump right into it. Quick note on myself, I'm Dan Bonet, Chief Revenue Officer here at User IQ. We offer a platform that helps businesses realize higher value through their CS teams by equipping them with product data, customer insights, and engagement tools needed to fight churn and grow their accounts. I'm gonna be facilitating the discussion today. Next we've got Jess Machina. VP of Account Management at Workable. Jess, if you don't mind, can you take a few minutes and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do at Workable. Sure thing. So again, as mentioned, I head up account management at Workable. It's a blended um, team made up of CSM activities, account management activities. So anything to do with, you know, once a contract is signed, following all the way through um, customer engagements to renewal. Um, workable, we're responsible for selling some terrific recruiting software. Happy to talk to anyone after the call. Um, and so we've helped a, a good number of folks globally hire um, and really provide an excellent candidate experience. Um, I've been doing CS-related work for over 20 years. I won't give you the exact number. 
Um, it ages me quite a bit, but I've been at companies like Success Factors, Thomson Reuters, and um, two and a half years ago, jumped into the startup pool um, working at Workable. Um, I'm in Boston, so go Pats this weekend. I know that that will be, well, be some more than that. Um, <laughs> I, again, I live in the Boston area and uh, some hobbies. I fly small planes and I commercially lobster. So if anyone's ever up in the area, happy to take you fishing. All right. Thanks, Jess. Pleasure to have you with us today. Next, we've got Michael Taylor, SVP of Global Customer Operations at Cook Dimensions. Michael, can you take a, little, uh, a few moments and say a few words about yourself? Oh, absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. So I lead our uh, post-sales functions at Click Dimensions globally. So similar to Jessica, we own the customer success uh, function as well as support and as well as all the back-end operations. So everything responsible from customer engagement through to commercial responsibility, um, retention, growth um, is falls within our team. Um, I've been at this as well about 15 years. Um, Jessica and I realized we probably crossed paths in the past because I spent about eight years at Career Builder, um, was where I really got off the ground, and then a, and, and then some time with uh, procurement software. Click Dimensions is a marketing automation and cloud solution for Microsoft Dynamics users. Um, so happy to talk to anyone who are Microsoft customers uh, for what we do. Um, as for myself, um, thumbs down with the Pats. I'm originally from Buffalo, so go Bills. And um, my spare time, I was a music undergrad, so still try to be a hobbyist with that as well as uh, enjoy that. Enjoy some good music and concerts, hopefully when COVID's over in my free time. So look forward to today's discussion. Absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Nice to have you with us. And next we have Chad, who's Director of Customer Success at Customer. Chad, if you don't mind taking a few moments and telling us a little bit about you. Sure. I, I just noticed that I haven't changed my shirt the entire COVID uh, time. Um, so my, my role here is our uh, Director of Customer Success at Customer. So Customer is a customer service CRM platform, and it's it's really changing the way that organizations are handling their overall customer experience. We don't look at tickets that come in. We, we, we look at them as people, and we look at it as conversations. And my role uh, is handling our customer success managers, and I have also uh, technical account managers that work on my team as well. Uh, I work under our CRO, and I have other colleagues, uh, colleagues as a director of professional services, and other colleagues as director of support, and we all work together, and our main goal is perfecting the customer experience. And I've been, similar to Jessica and Michael, I've been in this area of customer success for many years, probably too many years I want to talk about, and I think when I first started out, uh, I also was in marketing automation. I worked for a company called Eloqua. It was uh, later purchased by Oracle and was very lucky just to be learning in customer success in SaaS and seeing this amazing profession that's taken off. So it's been exciting. So I have a huge passion for customer success. And I'd say in my spare time, which is rare, I do like to bike and get outside and uh, one day I hope to travel again. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks for that, thanks for the chat and, and nice to have you with us again. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do as we kick off our first discussion topic is we're going to do one more poll. This is related to our first topic, so we want to get some some input from the audience as well about um, how they're doing from and the topic of health scores. So again, this question is: My company has highly accurate health scores, enabling the CS teams to know the true state of their accounts. We'll give you again 45 seconds or so to answer the poll, and then we'll kick off the first topic and talk about your responses. And Chad, to your point about tenure, um, I guess we should all say then that we're 29 and have been at this 10 years. <laughs> Okay, interesting. This one is split three ways between we have highly accurate health scores, we don't have highly accurate health scores, and we don't use health scores at all. So that's uh, that's that's interesting. So maybe yes, is this what you 
And how would you how would you respond to those numbers? It's interesting, right? So it, it a little bit surprising. Um, I wonder too, as we get further in the discussion, we talk about situational accuracy, right? With everything going on these days, um, I wonder if that plays into any of this. Um, but pleased to see it's so high that that folks that they that they have an accurate health scoring. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the numbers, you know, seventy percent of people are using health scores of some some fashion. Half of those seventy percent think that their scores are accurate. And half of them don't think the scores are accurate, so that'd be interesting to understand why um, and what challenges people are having with the accuracy of their health scores. Michael, what are your thoughts on, on the poll results? I'm actually a little surprised as well. Of course, we joked in advance that if 80% answered true, I would call BS immediately. But um, I think it's interesting and it's good to see the, the 70% that are already leveraging health scores in some capacity. Um, and I think you nailed it. What I'd be curious of is, you know, like for us to discuss a little more of if we feel if they're accurate or they're not, what are those drivers? Like where where can you fine tune, if you will, to align to what the goals you have are with health scores? Because I think that could be part of it too. I think I would be curious to learn more of, you know, for all of us, the diversity and how we're leveraging them um, in terms of the customer lifecycle and back to the business. And I think as we have that discussion today, um, I think will help provide some light and maybe some different approaches that we have with this in terms of um, best practices. Great. Chad, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I was expecting the uh, true to be even less. So I think that uh, that, that that seems pretty accurate. Uh, it's a good starting point for today. Yeah. And, and you know, the good thing is for the, for the falses, right, where they don't feel like they have accuracy, that's part of the conversation is how can you how can you build a health score that um, that has a high degree of accuracy and then for the ones that don't use it yet we'll be talking about you know foundationally how do you even get things set up so again that leads us into this first topic which is great um, and, and I want to start I wanted to start with this topic because of the challenges in creating health scores that actually are useful and accurate and as we can see from those numbers um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of discrepancy in, in how people are leveraging them so Maybe let's start out with a framework, right? How should we be thinking about health scores? What's the goal that people should have in mind when putting these together and how do you get started on that journey? Chad, why don't you lead us off with this one? Sure. I would say that in terms of how to think about this, you really want to think about what's your objective. And I think that um, you know both Michael and Jessica were alluding to this. Is your objective to understand if your customers are going to renew? Is your objective to understand how your customers, let's say, are doing in a certain phase of the customer lifecycle, like in during onboarding or implementation? Is it to gauge how valuable those customers are to you? So you really have to understand, and, and typically people will use it for to gauge if your customers are going to renew. Uh, that's, that's the typical use case, but I would, you, you need to make sure that you know what the objective is and you set that objective up front and you communicated that. The next thing in terms of getting started, I would say that this is probably where it gets overly complex, where people try to jump you know, to that uh, touchdown, maybe we use the football analogy, uh, where they really just need to get the first down. And um, you know, as an example, when I came into customer, the way we were managing customer health is that we had a spreadsheet and there was the you know, green, yellow, and red, and it was not updated, it was, it was a mess, it wasn't communicated well, and I was like, okay, Let's use our CRM. Let's start somewhere. Let's start to unify the different terms. You know, what is you know, what is a red? What is a green? What is a yellow? And keep it really simple. And just starting there, you know, so what we did is we just, we created the green, yellow, red. We created reason codes. We created a at-risk detail. And then what's the next steps? We got those into our CRM. And then I started to collect that information. And I didn't put a big, you know, you know, requirement from the team, like you need to make sure that that's updated every week in terms of, you know, what's going on with the client. I was more concerned in terms of, you know, who's at risk in terms of potentially at risk for the renewal, why they are at risk, and then what are we doing to get them back on track? And, and then just other stuff, like what are some good stories that we want to learn from our customers, not like, hey, like every week I need to make sure you're doing that. So in any case, I think in terms of getting started, you know, know your objective, and then two, keep it really simple and start there and, and move from there. 
Awesome. Thank you, Chad. Jessica, well, how do you guys think about this at your company? If you were if you were getting things started, what would you be looking at? Yeah, so for us, similar to what, what Chad mentioned, I think for us, we have the advantage, we have a data management team. So we were able to take some, as Chad mentioned, I think one of the big themes here and what we should be thinking about is not just the health score itself, but the data ahead of that and the objective afterwards, what you're going to do with that information, how you're going to measure it. And so for us, it was critical to really get a sense of, you know, what factors and features are used? How are people doing things to get a sense of, you know, if they're going to churn, are they going to be happy, unhappy? Is there an opportunity to grow them? And then to take that, and as Chad mentioned, we started in spreadsheets too. Um, you know, we had the color scheme. I think we called it, I didn't design it, but it was something like the, um, the misery scale, I think is what we called it. Um, okay. Together, to do data polls so the AMs and CSMs didn't have to do manual work. And then we found a way to put it into a system. And then from that, again, to your point, Chad, not a, what are those, you know, for us, it's, it's 14 items, but what are those things that we can capture that are measurable and that the team doesn't have to put so much time into to then be able to see if that's a symptom of something, right? For us, it's all about symptoms. Um, not the end all be all, but it's just pointing you in the right direction of where you need to spend more time. And then the flip side of it, pulling from that system, how we use that for references, how we use that for going back to our customer base and, and doing the check-ins we should proactively or reactively. Got it. Okay. And uh, Mike, love to hear your perspective. And I do have a couple of questions coming in on this topic. So I'm going to try to bring some of those in to the conversation as well. I think, I think Jess and, Jessica and Chad hit a lot of the, the good best practices in setting up uh, you know, the right data and aligning to your objectives. Um, one of the areas that we look at it at, at Click, um, I'm going to introduce a slightly different angle to this, which is kind of at two different levels, if you will. So from an individual customer perspective, we take a very similar approach to what Jessica said, which is it's less of a reliance on the health score or color, if you will, but the way I would, the way we view um, the customer health measures or the data that we're pulling in is it's really less about the overall color but more about the engagement itself it's showing different levels of customer engagement and potentially good or bad sentiment and establishes for us potential calls to action whether it's mitigation or you know opportunities for further growth or ways to exploit the relationship further or enable the relationship further however if you start to aggregate some of the, if you start to look at what are the really key measures in terms of customer health or potentially opportunity or risk, you can start to get a portfolio level view as well in terms of whether it's across the region or across the enterprise, which especially as we got into 2020, I think started to enable us in terms of a forecasting perspective to get a better understanding of what's our overall opportunity and risk back up to the leadership or to the investor class as well. So, you know, we, we try not to overthink the individual score at the customer level, but understand what are the drivers in, in terms of different changes and trends and how that aligns to the customer's goals. But then you have an opportunity to look at a portfolio view as well. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. So <clears throat> I'm going to ask my follow on question to this, and then we'll get to some of the audience questions. So I've observed that in talking to many people like yourselves that once you have the you're starting to build like your health score you're like oh i'm going to factor this in i'm going to factor this in and then you start your your brain just starts expanding you're like oh we have this data point and this data point and this data point and there's this tendency to want to pull lots of data into your health formula how do you keep from overcomplicating it and in your opinions you know what are some of the signals you should start with jess would you mind kicking this one off yeah sure happy to so Again, for us, we've been able to quantify where we see people turn or where we see that the behaviors change. Um, and, and that for us allows us to be able to say, okay, it, it, similar to what you mentioned, there are hundreds of data points. There are all kinds of things that we can pull in. And even beyond the health score itself, our AMs are accountable to, to maintaining, monitoring all kinds of different data. But for us, it was really trying to get into kind of a formula of, you know, if we see that folks are using this much or this many people are engaging in this way, or we've got this kind of follow through, 
um, that tend to, tends to give us a good signal and then we've set up our ranges. So similar to what Michael said, you know, a lot of trend data. Um, so for us, I think it was a matter of just being crystal clear and understanding exactly what those triggers are for, you know, what how a healthy account behaves, right? And how an unhealthy account behaves um, and then being able to just focus on those things. And then we give the account management team you know, the opportunity and, and the ability to track in our CRM these different areas for engagement. I think that, that that's been incredibly helpful for us, just allowing us to not, it is easy to do, right? You do have access to so much data. Yeah. Okay. Thank, uh, thanks, thanks, Jess. Michael, what about you? <clears throat> what do you think about this? We were an example of a group that initially overcomplicated this. <laughs> so I can speak to that. Um, it just talked about the Jessica talked about the data and it was totally true. And one of our first initiatives here a few years ago was to start to integrate all the data into one place, which was our, our success platform at the time. And then there was kind of a little bit of a rush towards figuring out an insight or a trigger and a scoring weighting for every possible variable known variable known to man. Well, what do you get at the end of the day? You get a, a customer health score, but what do you do with it? And so we, we kind of stripped that back and started to look at, you know, what's most important for what the CSM or our customer success team needs to understand in terms of the customer's behaviors towards, again, what are potentially risks or opportunities. And so we break it down now if we look at our customer health into really two main areas of engagement from a customer's perspective. One, in terms of their engagement and adoption of the product and solution itself. And, and obviously we want you know, a high level engagement and stickiness, but also from a relationship perspective. And it could be that certain data points cross those lines and can lead to some, you know, different points of view. So we, we really took a step back to simplify it and say, okay, of these many, many data points, many, we don't have to worry about putting a weight per se, or, but it's really a call to action, but let's look at, can we drive successful engagement from a users and product perspective and know it aligns to their goals? And then from a relationship perspective, are there any risks there in terms of sentiment, um, changes in stakeholders, um, the last time we were in contact, et cetera, to where those were kind of the key points for the CSM in terms of driving the relationship ultimately through to renewal and commercial ownership. And we started to move forward from there. So we went all in initially, went way overboard, took a step back and now aligned it towards what we realized were the right goals and, and um, intelligence points. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And that, that addresses one of the questions that we, we actually had quite a few questions on this topic come in from the audience. I don't know if we're going to get to them all. One of them was around some of the common pitfalls in this area. And it seems like you, you had the wonderful experience of dealing with a common one. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, I, I think that's uh... When I, when I think about scoring and, and the sort of the manual and versus like the automated, I think the technology has really come very far and there's different things that you can do and leverage that you couldn't even leverage, let's say a few years ago. So as an example, one of the things that you would want your CSM to do would be when they get off a call, somehow indicate like, you know, how that call went. And, you know, that would be part of your score. And what you can do now is like there's technology that transcribes the calls automatically looks for like key indicator words like churn words like contract or um i don't know leaving cancel and you can blend that in to your scoring model and in ways that you couldn't do it before uh, and i think the the other thing is that we just learned so much at one point it was like oh they're submitting support tickets that's, that's not a good thing uh and you know it, it turned out that people were doing research and everyone should do their own research on this how, how it translates to your company but it actually tracking engagement is an important thing. You wanna make sure that your customers, let's say, if you're sending out a product update to your customers, that they're engaging with that and you can leverage that and blend that into your scoring potentially. So I think that um, you, know, you wanna take as much away from your CSM as you can. Uh, but again, it all depends on your particular product. How best can you get to your objective? But I always think about the person who's actually trying to do that manual thing. Are you adding one more thing that's gonna provide value or are you just giving them some other task because it's going to fulfill some sort of management obligation that you have? Got it, great, thank you, Chad. Um, I'm gonna 
hit on a couple of these questions from the audience. I'm gonna just point them to like one of y'all so that we don't, otherwise we're gonna run out of time. So I thought this was an interesting one. Um, and this one came from Heidi. Uh, the majority of our customers are smaller in size. In, in her example, she said, pays less than $1,000 a year, but let's take any company with a large number of smaller customers. How do you draw the line between um, what customers need a CSM and certainly how can health scores factor into how you manage those customers? Um, I'm gonna go with round robin here. Michael, how about you for this one? Oh my God, I win. Um, <laughs> that's a really great question. Um, in a previous life, we when we stood up the CSM team at Career Builder, actually, we leveraged existing headcount and to get, we kind of drew a line at maximum um, efficiency or, or an impact. And so it was a dollar amount per segment and where if you were over a certain dollar amount, you qualified for this customer team, including a CSM, et cetera. And our goal was to cover as much of the ARR as possible with the headcount we had to start with. So that's a potential approach. For us today, we're we're in a similar model. We're not at a the thousand dollar mark, but we definitely are more SMB to middle market uh, customer segment or customer base. So it's we're going to be higher volume um, and not enterprise as much in terms of dollar size. And because of that, um, we haven't drawn a line yet. So for us, everybody, if you join Click, you have a CSM, you have the customer team, you work with our services team for onboarding. Um, and training across the board. Now, in terms of maximizing our impact as we look into the future, you know, the next turn for us, and this will be a common theme, I'm sure, for everybody here, is getting into customer profiling and segmentation. So, start to be able to have enough, um, you know, information and understanding of our customers to say, okay, for those that are larger size or potentially strategic, you know, start to have a different focus in terms of our plays to accommodate them because the goals are going to be different for the customer and for us. And then start to look at even increasing our automation more than we have for those that just are solid users, but just need a little help in the day to day, but are more um, self-sufficient. So um, segmentation is definitely a help. You can look at dollar values. You can even look at it as an add on in terms of a percent of contract. There's a few ways to you, you can go with it. It just really depends on how you want to fund the team, and then what some of the top line goals are going to be as it looks to the PL of the business. Got it. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through one more question. Um, this one I'm gonna address to Jess. Uh, how soon? And this one's from this one's from Laura. How soon once a new customer is signed up do you assign them their initial health score? That is a terrific question. So for us. I, our onboarding typically takes anywhere from two to four weeks for a customer, right, for them to get started. So we actually have set milestones that we expect a customer to complete through their onboarding that we track through our CRM separately from health scoring. When we hit the 90 day mark, and again, it's going to vary by company. It, it's for sure dependent on, you know, your product, your, you know, customer experience and, and how long it takes to implement. But for us, we set the, the window of 90 days from when we first start capturing a health score. That's how we manage it. We felt at that point, they've got enough time where, again, if it's, and we're similar, we've got, you know, a, a number of smaller customers, high volume, but then we also have, we've segmented, we have a, a bigger subset as well. 90 days seems to hit the mark for all of those, all of those customers. Um, and at that point, they've got a good amount of usage and we can head off any issues pretty early on. Um, they're not too far down the path. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. Appreciate that. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we've got this starting point, um, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Let's dig a little bit deeper. And so we started talking about these objective data sources, right? Things that you've got in usage and your experience and data that you're collecting about your customers, which certainly provide a great signal on how the customers are doing, how they're feeling, from ticketing systems and things like that. But there's also a lot of subjective data that gets collected through conversations with your CS team. How do you guys factor in the subjective data when you're thinking about a customer's health? Michael, would you please move us off on that? Hmm. This, is, this is a great, this is gonna be an interesting one to hear everyone's perspective on. Um, for us currently at Click, um, there, 
the the objective or the 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 system data, let's call it, or the data that the signals that we can pull in um, are there again as an engagement measure and calls to action for the CSM. At the end of the day, the subjective metrics are the ones that are really tied to the bottom line. So if we look at our forecasting um, in terms of uh, renewals, we and uh, Chad, you hit the, hit on this earlier, but if you if we have a bottom line goal with renewals and we have a forecast around green, red, yellow um, renewal risk, you know, if we can get to the point where we're really solid and accurate in terms of our overall historical conversion rate at those colors, those are a subjective perspective from the CSMs from their relationships with the customers. So for us, currently, the, the objective metrics are there as an assist in terms of the toolkit for the CSMs, but the but the perspective they have in their conversations are the ones ultimately we're looking at in terms of our bottom line forecasting for moving forward. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. How about Chad, what's your perspective on this one? Yeah, I think something I was saying earlier is that um, you, you just need to make sure that you don't put too much on the subjective. I mean, it's, it's, if you can, having more objective metrics is really great because the objective metrics like things like like some sort of adoption metrics, what they tend to do is they tend to help you see around corners. Because you know if you if you've nailed it and you've uh, pulled out the right type of indicators, they'll like I was doing this and just doing some rough analysis, pulling data, and we're trying to pull together some sort of you know health score uh, that goes beyond the, the manual part. And I was like, oh, we got to go talk to these clients. Like there's some there's something wrong here. We can see from the data, and and I think that it's really important now. On the subjective side, the the that's I would say more should be more focused almost on the relationship and how the client is feeling. And by relationship, I would mean how deep are you with that client? Um, if you are just talking to you know the person maybe that's using your product, but not the person who's deciding if they're going to stay with you, that is a problem. Like you need to make sure that you've spoke to the right person. If there's a change in their organization, a new person comes on. This is where the objective metrics may not tell you oh, everything looks good from the adoption perspective, but there's a new person there, that part needs to be probably read until you've actually gone and shown the value of what your solution can provide and understand what those outcomes are they're trying to achieve. So that, that's how I, I tend to look at those things. And ultimately, your customers will tell you, how do they actually feel about how working with you? And um, there's things that you can do there even to automate it. So as an example, and this is maybe good for SMBs, uh, one just very simple automation I put in place is at the six month before renewal mark, I have an email that's triggered up to my SMB CSM team. And it's just a simple question. You know, if your manager was to come and ask you if you would have purchased a product, um, let's say, you know, when, when you first came on, what would, how would you answer that? And it's just a simple question. And you're looking for two things. You're hopefully looking for a positive response, but any response is good. It means they're engaging with you. And if there's no response, then you need to double down. And it's almost like there's a set path. Like, okay, send a follow-up email. If they haven't responded to that, call them. Um, so that way you turn those objective parts into more of a systemized approach to your scoring model. Got it. Awesome. Thank you, Chad. Jess, how would you respond? Yeah, I think similar to Michael, we use it in the same fashion. So for us, our actual health score itself is very objective-based. It's very much, it, we do have some things in there like the last time we've engaged with them or for us, we have different integrations into the system. Um, similar to what Chad mentioned, we're in need to have kind of software, right? It's recruiting, so they're going to be using it. Are they happy? Are they delighted? Do they wanna be using us? They'll use us up to the very last minute that they churn. So we're utilizing then more of a subjective measurement outside of our actual formal health scoring we track it where I use that and, and the team's pretty accurate. We've got a scoring mechanism that gives them a sense of, you know, like it's a one through five and are they going to renew? They're not going to renew and, and how happy are they? And that's what we rely upon. That works for us. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. I've got two more questions in this area. I'm going to try to do my best to combine them for the sake of time. And Jess, I'm going to, I'm going to direct this one as a follow up to you. And it's around, combining the two data sources, the objective and the subjective one together, right? You know, it's great if they both tell you the same thing, right? And sometimes it's very confusing if one is saying the opposite of the other, like you're, 
your CSM is saying everything is great, this customer loves us, every time I talk to them they're happy, but all the data-driven signals are saying that it's a high churn risk, right? And so there's, we'd love to hear how you think about blending these two together, what to do when they're pointing in the opposite directions, and certainly everybody loves a good fail story. So any, uh, any failures or challenges that you've experienced in, in doing this would be, would be great to share. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And, and we've depended on one over the other at varying points and you get burned by it, right, at some point. Because you do develop good relationships with people and no one wants to give you bad news that they're going to leave. And so it's, again, good news up to the end. I think for us, again, we use that objective to give us a sense of, you know, what are the symptoms? What is happening? How are they using it? For us, too, we have to consider seasonality. We have to consider you know, the behaviors, how they're doing things, what industry are they in, how, you know, some of those things will throw off those scores. So it's a good opportunity when the team gets an alert that their customer falls in one range or another to take a look at that and balance that against what they believe is happening there. And then from there, we're having conversations in our one-on-ones and talking about, you know, what happens. I think the other cool part too is, and I encourage everyone to do this, is to do a historical review, right? take a look at what your scoring was and take a look at what churned in the last quarter, two quarters and see how accurate. Um, we check ourselves all the time. When we first push this out, um, again, patted ourselves on the back, doing a great job, everything looks great. Totally had to change it, right? We had to make some adjustments and updates. And, and again, I think going back and looking at how you're scoring and how folks that renewed or, or churned or upgraded, what the actual scores were telling you and that'll give you a better sense when you hone in. But some of it is industry-based, it's regional, it's, there's a lot involved. It's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all, unfortunately. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Michael, how about yourself? Any, uh, what's your perspective on this and any great failure stories that you just love to share with the audience? You just share failure <laughs> stories with this group. Um, <laughs> Jessica really hit on a key part of this, which is, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's how accurate are you in terms of your you're forecasting ahead. Um, one thing I would also state is how systemic is that disconnect, if you will? Is it you know, regionalized or is it across the board? Um, in terms of a, a non-success, um, kind of to that end, in a, in a, you know, earlier on in this, and when we weren't as flushed out with our health scoring and really just relied on um, subjective viewpoints in terms of um, the relationship and the feedback, um, we did, a, we did a historical analysis like Jess was talking about, and we were looking at what was the last color reported in by the team before it churned. And there were certain pockets where we had as much as 75% green, not red. And it was kind of, okay, we've got a, we got a challenge here. And so, you know, and, and I would say, you know, that in and of itself is interesting, but it's a call to action. And the call to action then becomes how much of it is in fine tuning the data and how much of it is in the coaching of the team themselves in terms of your own motions. And so, you know, fast forward to now, it, it again, it comes back to, you know, how accurate are you in terms of really understanding, you know, the base and then how it affects the bottom line. And, and that's something that we look at in terms of our forecasting 90 days out. And if we start to stay consistent and accurate in terms of what we're showing is the renewal risk versus what's actually happening, then that's the calibration we're looking at in the right spot across the board. But again, without more, you can't tell if it's coaching or data, it could be both. So you have to dig yep. in more. Makes sense, thanks. <clears throat> thanks Michael. Chad, what would you add to this? Uh, I would say that in terms of um, approaching the, the, the different components of the score, one thing I would say, and maybe this kind of goes back to getting started. Some people are like, well, what, what are those criteria that I should use for my scoring? And that's maybe something we haven't really talked about too, too much. One of the things that what I did like a long time ago is this, this, there's a concept called bright spots. And bright spots, the whole idea there is that there's someone that's doing something and they're somehow surviving or doing better than other people. And you want to go and look and see what they're doing and mimic what that is and try and, you know, replicate that and so when it comes to scoring you can do that and say okay these customers are really successful let's use some of the criteria that they're doing and build that out as part of my scoring model and then you can do the opposite too where you can look at kind of what jess was saying where you look at me looking at your poor customers 
and find out, okay, why were they poor? Why did they churn? Why did they kind of go into that low, low performing model? And, and just start there, like start with those few criteria and don't try and get everything, um, but try and start with a few of those criteria and go off of those and see where that takes you and do some experimenting and, and do some further digging and research. So that's just hopefully uh, it can help people in terms of how they can think about building out those scoring models. That's great, thank you, thank you, Chad. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna do another poll around the topics that we just talked about. Um, and so thinking about the, the tension between objective and subjective scoring, we'd love to get a sense on how everybody does in this area. And the question is, my poll is like my company, is regularly surprised by conflicting objective and subjective class scores or customer or customer sentiment. So if you don't mind responding to this real quick and then we'll, we'll have a quick chat about the results. Why didn't we think of including like the Jeopardy music or something for these? Remember that uh, round table. That's a good question. We were expecting you to hum. Yeah, God. Disaster. <laughs> Make us a happy hour round table and then we'll do that. <laughs> this is good advice for next time. <laughs> Okay, so the results are in, and it looks like um, about 33% of people say that they're regularly surprised, 30% say they're not surprised, and then 37% um, don't know or may not use health scores. So interesting. Chad, I'm gonna direct this one to you um, for you know your thoughts on the results of that. Is that surprising? Is that kind of what you expected? How would you how would you yeah, feel? I think it, it, it makes sense. Uh, I think that for the most part, scoring is not really understood, uh, even by the person who maybe creates it. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, it's just something that um, it's hard to put together. And at times, uh, in customer success in general, not enough communication is done to the company in terms of what it means, what it does, what the impact is, and then like how to action off of it. So I think it's just a problematic part. Um, of health scoring and, and somewhat customer success in general. Uh, you know, as one example, even tomorrow morning, we have a bunch of new people joining the company and I invited lots of different people across the company to join the session so they can learn more about what we do and all those different things. And I think it's just a really important component of customer success in general. And so scoring is obviously a big part of that. Great, thank you, Chad. We're gonna go on to our, to our next topic here. Um, and so, as I think about creating this system and working on the health scores, this formula, lots of people do that. They, they make a lot of assumptions or they talk to people like themselves and they think, okay, how should I do this? What's some advice you have? They build out their formula only to find out that six months later, they're way off base, right? And it's not telling them the things that they were hoping it would tell them with any degree of accuracy. That can be very frustrating. We touched on this topic a little bit during the prior discussions, but I think for the folks that are lower in their maturity of building health scores or haven't done it yet, starting to think about it, <clears throat> what can they do to create the best first version of their health scores? Um, which attributes are most important? How much weighting should they give um, those attributes? How do they figure that out? Um, would be a great great topic to, to discuss. So Michael, if you don't mind kicking us off with this one. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if, if you really want to start simple, um, it's a few things, right? So one, you know, what, are, what is the goal of, of leveraging customer health in these signals? And we've talked about this at the beginning, but there could be different scenarios. So you have to understand that. Number two, this goes to what Jessica was talking about, you know, how will the customers find success and how will they recognize value and revenue with you? And then three, you know, I would start with something as simple as even a, a, a high level journey map as well. You know, walk it through and then start to think through, okay, what are those key points of interaction that we have with the customer they're with us, different handoffs, and then to the bottom line, which is they're renewed, they're engaged, and they're happy. And just, it's gonna vary to each individual you know, organization, but from there, start to look at, okay, 
what can we do to start to listen in these different areas? And do we have that data? And even if you're compiling it on as simple as a spreadsheet, great, or pulling reports, but um, you know, start with that and start with a clean slate and then build up from there. Don't don't run to the end the, the end zone. We'll use another football analogy from earlier. Um, trying to think of creating this great algorithm because you're not going to understand what it's even telling you. There's no point in doing it. If at the end of the day, even from that starting point, that you start to understand the customer journey, where there's potential risks, and those are the moments that you want to gauge in more and have better intel, perfect. Just start with that. And then in time, you know, the topic here being, when will it make sense? If you start to see it align and it's providing consistency and accuracy to what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day. But start simple and iterate bottom up. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay. Uh, Jess, what are your thoughts on this topic? Would you, would you dispute anything that Michael just suggested? Maybe add a little conflict in our, in our webinar today or was he pretty much on point? <laughs> Not on this topic. I, again, football, yes. No, this topic, no. I think he's. <laughs> Right, right. It, it, it really is starting off simple and making sure whatever data you're going to use in your score, you feel confident that it's easy to pull. It's something that's going to be consistent. It's something that you can measure. It's something that everyone in your org understands. Um, and you don't have to build, like we're at 14 points. We didn't start at 14 points. We started at just a few things that we knew were levers, right? And then think about how you're able to build that out and make sure it makes sense and that it's actionable at the end of it. Right, that's the problem is folks tend to build these scores. Great, you've got a health score, now what do you do with it? Um, yeah. You know, we, we made blunders too. I mean, we made we tried to attach comp to this at one point. I mean, we've, we huh. don't do that, um, but we tried to do that. So, I mean, I think Michael's right on, start small, make sure you've got a good sense of those milestones, those levers, and that again, you're thinking about how to make it actionable at the end of it. Um, and that you're measuring it, you're you're checking yourself, as I said earlier, go back and test and make sure you've got it right. Um, because oftentimes okay. you have the right variables, you may not have the right weighting, right? That's the other thing to look at afterwards. Chad, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think the one of the things I was mentioning earlier is in terms of starting starting small, but the other thing is we have a value here at customer called uh, scrappiness, so scrappiness with a K. And so one of the things that you can do is just because you may not have like the perfect data or you may not even have like some of the right technology that you need right, you know, right away, start to um, look at the data sources that you have and look at who can help you. And, and I think one of the great things you can do is you can use Salesforce and Google Spreadsheets if you have Salesforce. And there's a nice add-on that Google Sheets has that you can have data from Salesforce poured into your spreadsheet. And then you can have, let's say, data from your system poured into that spreadsheet and start to mix that data together and just do small experiments and one, so for an example, one of the things that I noticed is like um, reporting is important, obviously, for, for many applications. And I wanted to make sure that our clients were using and creating X amount of reports. And so I just started to do some experiments to see, does that make sense? And that's just I would recommend, you know, start small. And, you know, pre at a previous company, I came in and just ripped out most of the technology and kind of blew it up and started again. Um, and that's and sometimes you need to do that in order for your scoring to make sense. Yeah, it sounds like if I if I heard what every every one of you said, there's a theme there. Is, is start out small. Don't try to overcomplicate the factors and the attributes that go into it. Um, expand that over time, and really look at health scoring from stage of the buyer journey, or sorry, stage stage of the customer journey, um, with a limited amount of factors. And then as you start to learn, then add more factors in to to see what else you can um, you can get it to be more accurate. Very awesome. All right, great, cool. So we do, uh, we actually had a couple of questions on that slide, but I'm gonna, I think they're more relevant towards the end of the present. So um, <laughs> this this topic is, is, um, is very topical to today's situations, right? You spend all this time and energy evaluating, assessing, perfecting your health scores over a year, two years. They're tuned, they're calibrated, they're just like you want them. And then COVID hits and nothing makes sense anymore. What, do you, what did you guys, what did you all do in this situation? Jess, what did you guys do at Workable? That's a great question. So our health scores didn't change, right? In terms of the actual components, what we had, how we manage it. Instead, what we're doing, what changes we're doing with those health scores, right? So instead of it being, 
that it's an alert trigger and you know the account's about to churn everybody's in a different state everyone's using again we're recruiting software the world stopped recruiting for a short while right but they're still on some weird standstills so for us because we have a number of different components we're able to look at the actual contributing factors in that health score and get a sense of what customer behavior was right so in a grand scale as michael mentioned we can pull trends we can see what in this particular region you know as the uk is going through furloughs and all these challenges what are they actually doing how do we change our growth recruiting platform to backfill recruiting platform how do we adopt what we're doing to make sure we're meeting the needs of, of what the customers are doing so instead of it calling you know the calls to action change um the mm -hmm. behavior instead so it still is very important and critical for us but instead it's allowing us to take a look to see you know viability within accounts how they're doing things how we can better support them um, and our outreach shifted so we changed our campaign model we reached out differently um, it really I'd say that that was probably the biggest change for us okay so it's what you did with the last ones as opposed to changing them it makes sense Michael, how about yourself and quick dimensions? How were you guys affected and what did you guys do with your, yeah. your model? So it, it's similar to, to what Jessica stated. I think the, the big area of focus became what can we learn from a, an enterprise risk perspective for, for us and, and also you know, what's changing in the behaviors of, of the customer base. And you know, initially, regardless of customer health and any scoring, it was, you know, all hands on deck to to have as much engagement as possible from a relationship perspective, from a promotional perspective, you know, anything we could do to be there. And I think what we saw is, you know, we for, for a lot of our customers, you know, communicating to their own community was critical. So, you know, we wanted to be there for them with in that regard without you know, profiting from that, if you will, it was, it was goodwill up front. Um, there were certain signals, if you will, or metrics that almost became counterintuitive as trend lines emerged to what we would report back for me to our CEO and to the board, which was, you know, the question became, you know, how does the customer base look in terms of their health or engagement? Are we seeing a big lift in churn or not? What are the drivers? And we broke it down to really a, a few, like four key areas that we started watching, a couple that were totally new, actually, to not even what was historically measured in customer health. So one was, Again, our overall engagement in email usage across the enterprise, we wanted to see if that was dropping or not. But the second one that was interesting was help desk ticket volume. And to me, if, it's, if it remained low, that was actually bad. And we actually saw that really lift. And to me, that was a positive sign because the engagement overall within the base was going up. So perfect, they're talking to us, we can be there to help them. And over time, we could start to watch that to see if either one of those were starting to move in a particular direction and what we could do to respond. Um, the other two is again, looking at churn itself specifically due to COVID reasons. And then lastly, if for any renewals, we had to get more creative in terms of um, be, being more flexible in terms of our, our contract terms for customers, let's say pushing net terms out 90 days versus you know time of uh, signing, things like that. Are we seeing a big lift in that or is that remaining low? So it really became boiling down to, okay, what it's most crucial in terms of us looking holistically ahead and really start to trend line that out. And that's become, that's an area that we still watch to this day um, as we continue to drive into 2021. Awesome, cool. Chad, if you don't mind taking a minute and, and, and sharing your, um, your experience with this. And then since we only have like five or six minutes left, we'll go on to, to the last topic. What happened? What happened over there at the at your company? Yeah, I think that the main thing is we just we didn't use the health score, the traditional health score. We built our own kind of list, like a COVID affected list. And I met with our executive team twice a week, and we reviewed it and reviewed what was happening. And it's just you handle it in a different situation. You just handle things differently and work through different scenarios. And then you come up with a regular thing once you see you know the the trends and how you should work in these situations and you go from there and it's been, I think, okay overall. And, and now, you know, we're getting to the sort of new normalcy and you can kind of go back to some of the things that you were doing before. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks, Chad. And hopefully we'll all be out of that situation really soon and we'll never rear its face again. Okay, so on, on to our last topic and hopefully we'll have a, a moment or two for some questions, but all right, so we've talked a lot of, about a lot of different things here. I want to see if there's guidance that we can give uh, the folks in the audience around 
how what makes sense in, in respect to sharing the health scores with the rest of the company and leadership so it becomes a useful tool for everybody in the organization how do you guys view this at your company jess would you lead us off with this one please sure so we fold the health score into a number of different initiatives we don't necessarily present it as you know here's the the overlying score of, of different regions or different different areas instead what we do is we use it for you know a component of getting a sense of, of forecasting which i'm bringing forward every week to our our executive team uh, we also fold it into our reference program so this along with nps other factors allows us to draw and create our, our referenceable customer list every month um, that helps fuel our ae team that's you know doing a number of different things for us um, we also factor it in a little bit more informally when it comes to product requests, right? So we're giving feedback to the product team in terms, I think Michael might have mentioned this earlier, in terms of, you know, additional development, we're considering the health score against, you know, the ACV for the contract and, and trying to, develop, to, to push that um, for development in that way. So that's how we're typically using it. Um, again, I mentioned we tried to use it for comp for our high tier customer base. For our high tier AMs, yeah, we we messed that up pretty good. We we thought we had a really good feel. We weren't considering multi tenancies. How do you handle complex companies, structures, contracts? Um, so it was a good learning mechanism for us. So we've kept it out of of the comp arena since we made those mistakes. But. Okay, good. Thanks for sharing that. I was going to bring that up as a as a as a question from the audience about including it in comp, and it sounds like that's a pretty bad idea. So. Um, yeah, you have to make sure it's so refined and that it's so well practiced. And we thought we had it there, and then a few things popped up that just didn't make yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. For somebody like yourself with a data science team backing you up, um, it sounds like that's a that's a that's a pretty hairy one to tackle for, for yeah. anybody. Yeah. Chad, what do you guys think about this question here uh, around sharing health score signals with leadership with the company? What do you guys do? Yeah, actually, I have an executive meeting in a few minutes, and it's on a monthly executive meeting where we go through client health and we talk about why clients are at risk, what are the trends, where's that going? The other thing that we do is, I mentioned this earlier, where sometimes your health scores will be in a system. And one of the things you can do is you can export that data, have it import into like a Google spreadsheet. And so that can, the whole company can see it, whatever platform they use, they can access a Google spreadsheet. The other thing is you wanna make sure that health data is in your support platform as well. So we use obviously customer. And so our, our health score data is in customer and our um, our technical support engineers can see that health score and that can factor into how they may respond, how they route certain things and how they prioritize certain things. Uh, thank you, Chad. Michael, any uh, any thoughts around how you guys are doing this? I know we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so uh, no, I love to hear uh, real quick. I think Jessica really hit on a lot of the similar things that we do. Um, we don't necessarily use a single health score, so I'm I'm on the executive team and so you know, for me, it's sharing kind of the bottom line results where we stand in, in terms of net revenue retention as well as churn and our forecasting ahead. Um, we also lead discussions within the organization around churn and churn drivers, um, which leads to, you know, especially if there's um, product development opportunities or relationship opportunities, what are those calls to action ahead? Um, when you get to a board level perspective, it's less around the, the again, the customer health, but you know, what are the actual insights that you can bring in terms of, you know, what were drivers in terms of where you've where you've achieved to this point, and then what are the next courses of action ahead in terms of getting to your bottom line operating plan? So, you you it's all the underlying elements. It's how you best leverage them in those different ways. Got it. Thanks, Michael. I uh, appreciate everybody's um, comments on this discussion. It was really good. Um, sadly, we're at the top of the hour, and unfortunately, we have to end our time together and wrap the presentation. I want to offer a huge thank you to our panelists for taking the time to prepare and be with us today and sharing their insights and experience. I hope everybody found it useful. Um, keep an eye out. We'll share copies of the presentation posted on YouTube, as I mentioned. Um, we may follow up with audience members if they have questions that we couldn't get to today. We'll try to provide you guys some responses. If you have any uh, thoughts or, or um, topics that you want use your IQ to do um, future webinars, future webinars on shoot me a note send me a post on linkedin and i'll i'll be sure to, to work those into our schedule thanks everybody for tuning in and have a great week thank you all